Jeffrey, the designing woman here. Today we're going to make a mosaic. Now, the tradition of mosaic making is thousands of years old. The ancient Greeks and Romans made exquisite ones, particularly uh, using f uh, stones and pieces of glass to create floor mosaics. Our project is not quite so permanent. We're going to just use paper. But I hope that while you're doing this project that you'll learn several things and put into practice some things we've discussed uh, in some of our earlier videos. We'll learn a little bit about composition. We'll learn about how to get some movement and action in your work and also to practice some of the color things that you've learned. So let's get started with the things that you're going to need. What you're going to need are pretty simple. You're going to need some plain white computer paper, uh, as I've suggested before, uh, white uh, HP laser jet paper is a sturdy paper, works great, but it really doesn't have to be that fancy. This is definitely a student project, and so we're not looking for anything that's extra archival. You may like the process and want to do it another time. You may want a little more sophisticated uh, background. You're also going to need colored paper. Um, you can use um, packs of origami paper, which are available in a lot of art supply stores. Um, they come in small sizes and larger sizes, and they're nice and brilliant, good colors. Or you can use just plain uh, construction paper that's available in lots of places. Uh, it's not going to hold, it's going to uh, fade in the light. Uh, if you leave it in light anywhere. So this is not a piece that's going to have to hang in a museum. Just know that it's student work if you're using construction paper. But it's very inexpensive and it's easy to use. You're also going to need a pencil and an eraser. And as I've suggested before, a white rubber eraser is a great solution. A simple pencil and an eraser. You're also going to need a fine line marker. Um, this is a Sharpie. You can use your pit pen or your Micron pen. It doesn't matter, but just a fine line marker. And it's not a concern in this particular situation about whether or not it's waterproof. You're going to need some scissors. And most of you will probably have some scissors kind of like this. They're fairly large. They're a little awkward. And you may be uh, better off if you can find them to have a smaller pair uh, like this that have nice sharp points and uh, smaller to hold in your hand. Um, you definitely need to do some very small trimming and cutting of pieces of paper. You're going to need a glue stick, last and not least. Uh, nothing fancy, just a glue stick, and that's how we'll be putting our paper down. So there you have it. Paper, pencil, scissors, glue. It's going to be fun. I hope you have a good time doing this project and uh, learn a lot. So let's get going. As you begin a project like this, you've got to decide, what am I going to draw? What am I going to have for my picture? You can work out of your head and uh, create a drawing out of your imagination. I did that, and I'm going to show you later. Uh, we'll pursue this uh, as part of our uh, practice in working with mosaic, but this is a drawing I did out of my head of a butterfly and some flowers. I have not added my black felt marker on it yet. It's still just a pencil drawing. So you could, this is a fairly complex one, and you'll see why in a little later, why I um, drew it this complicated and what I did. You may not really feel that confident about drawing out of your head and want to have something uh, from a magazine or a book that um, is a good picture. So one of the things you could choose to do is go through magazines and look at different uh, drawings or, or pictures that you might want to use. This little picture of this little dog might be a lot of fun to do. It will need to be simplified quite a bit, and you would want to do a line drawing. But the nice part is that in this particular picture, there's big areas of color that you can um, use um, your mosaic techniques to build the color that's in this little dog, and you'll see that in a little while. So this would be a, probably a good likely kind of picture you might want to use. Another one might be something like this, where it's just totally funny. It's kind of a lunch... Um, 
uh, portable lunch thing advertisement. It's just kind of a crazy picture of people. Uh, and I picked this particular one as a possible way that you might want to choose a picture. If you're going to do something like this and there's things that are really complicated in it, simplify it. Just an orange shirt, just a, a white or a blue shirt, or maybe just a gray shirt. You don't have to do every detail. You can simplify it dramatically. And so, uh, and your figure can be quite simple. You don't have to have every detail in his plaid shoes. Um, you may want to add these other figures. You may want the things in the background. Um, you are the one that's going to make this picture, so you can work it over yourself. Another possibility might be um, a simple figure drawing or simple thing that is almost abstract. In this particular one, I noticed there's big bands of color, of green, of blue, and orange, uh, or the soft coral color, and this uh, kind of ivory cap, and this pathway. It really is almost an abstract painting, and you could do something, let that be a jump off and an idea for an abstract painting. You might want to um, go ahead and try to make the figures, but on the other hand, you may just want to do blocks of color and pieces uh, and use that as an idea. Um, there was another one here I missed. Let me see. Here we go. The one of the dog on the back side is one of a face. I would recommend, at least for now, not trying to do a face. If you'll notice, there's just huge amounts of uh, color that are very, very um, subtle distinctions in color. And this could be a real problem in this early program. So I would avoid um, faces unless you're going to stylize them and make, make your face um, quite just very um, almost um, abstract. So avoid that may be a good jump off, but um, think about that. Also, if you're planning to do something as complicated as this cat, you need to recognize that this is going to need a little bit different technique, like the second techniques I'll show you than the first one. So bear in mind this cat drawing is something that has a lot of um, direction in the um, picture. I don't know, here, this people, you could have a very simple blocks of color as opposed to this cat, there's a lot of curves and subtle changes in color that would require a little bit different handling of the, the pieces that you're going to use when you make your mosaic. You might want to go to some place like Sports Illustrated or some other, uh, uh, maybe a newspaper clipping of a person doing some kind of a sport technique. This one would be a really great picture. It's got some really interesting uh, shapes and colors and um, would be easy to simplify into a drawing that would and a picture that would make a really great um, picture. So look for something kind of like that. I found one I just think is kind of interesting. It's actually uh, a magazine ad for a breakfast cereal. But I folded it back and decided that if I were to, to crop this picture by folding things away and folding up here, I can end up with a very interesting, almost um, abstract picture of a barn and some silos and some trees and a field and the sky. So it's really quite simple, but it's going to be an interesting challenge. So this so let's start from there and begin with our drawing. Now to prepare your drawing, now that you've chosen what you want to do, you're going to need to make a uh, create it with a black uh, pencil and eraser. You may want to redo it. You may trace it down like we talked about before. <clears throat> but now I'm ready to make a line drawing uh, with my uh, fine line marker. This does not have to be waterproof, as you remember, um, in this particular case, because we're not going to try to be using water on top of it, so that does not matter. So I've drawn this down here on my paper, and I'm going to add my fine line marker, just do my simple outline. And when I'm done, I want this to look kind of almost like a color book picture. As you can see, I'm going to do an outline of everything that I want. Now one of the things that I'm going to do is where um, <clears throat> I want uh, a shadow in, let me get this building in here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to go ahead and do the whole side of this um, silo and this side of this silo. It's top and 
up at the top it has a slight curve because it's uh, we're looking at it from below but then as it approaches where we're looking at it straight on this curve is going to get less and less and so that by the time we get down to ground level or eye level where we would be standing and look at it the um, bands are going to be much straighter. You notice my lines straight, 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 and they begin ever so slightly to curve so that we know that we're looking up at that silo. Okay, that's one aspect, but then here's the roof line on that conical silo, and here's the door on this far barn, and I want to leave a white band to help define that, so I'm going to put a double line there. But there are shadows under these roof lines. I don't know if you remember in our drawing, Underneath that roof line, there's a shadow, and underneath that one, I want to build a shadow. So I'm going to put a dotted line to remind myself of where I want to put uh, the darker uh, shadowed colors underneath there. So that's my little clue that I'm going to be changing color at that spot. So here we are. We have our basic drawing. I've done it with a felt tip. <clears throat> fine line felt tip, and I'm ready to begin. Now when it comes time to choose color for your picture, I want you to think about what we learned about color. When I look at this barn, you say, oh, there's a red barn. That's the first thought that we have. But when I picked a piece of paper out of red paper, I thought, oh, that's the barn color. But when I hold it up, against here. I don't know if you can see. It's really not as red as I thought. So I went back to my pile and I found a red orange. And I want you to notice that the red orange is far closer to the red barn than the red red. And so I'm going to use this red orange to create my barn color. I'm going to use the red red as part of my shadows underneath the eaves. And I'm going to use a little bit of black up underneath the eaves to give it a little bit of pop. Black tends to have a good popping effect. When I'm looking for these silos, you notice that this is a gray. This is almost a blue color. So I'm going to be using this blue gray for this silo over here. And I'm going to use two shades of gray for the um, other silo here. And one of the things I'm going to, these are part of my origami paper pack. One of the things I'm going to do, I realize there's kind of a highlight down the center and I want to emphasize the roundness of it. So I am going to use some of this and the back side of this paper um, to create um, the highlight area, the light part, especially like right here at the top of the silo, that curvy uh, bright highlight there. <clears throat> I don't have in my pack of construction paper a wonderful tan color, so I decided what I need to do to create this, and I'm going to let my eye blend, uh, I'm going to use uh, a little bit of this ivory color, it's not quite white, and I'm going to use some brown to help, uh, and I'm going to intermix the pieces, and I'm going to intermix some yellow to get some of this uh, lively quality of the wheat that's in the foreground. And so hopefully when I get closer to the, the barn, it's uh, far less distinct and I can use uh, primarily just the, the, uh, let me go here, the ivory color close to the barn and then add, begin adding in the brown and the yellow as I get closer to the foreground. I'm probably going to use um, a series of several blues in my sky. Um, if you notice here, I can pull this forward and you can see I've got quite a few different blues to pick from, blues and turquoises to choose from. And so I think I will probably end up with some of these very pale, uh, turquoisey uh, pale colors here for my sky. But we'll get to that after a while. Right now, I'm going to get started and uh, start putting color down on my picture. In this particular simplified version of mosaic making, I want to use uh, a, an even size or closely even size of um, pieces to create my 
drawing. So I set that up, get this organized here. You notice that some of these use this paper and cut stars out of this one. It doesn't really matter. I can go ahead and use some leftover paper here and it doesn't matter if it's kind of all whacked up because I can cut and get it cleaned up and then begin cutting some strips. And here's where your larger scissors might come in handy. I've got a fairly big space, but it's still I want to fill it with fairly small pieces. So I think what I'm going to do is cut strips of about that wide, similar width. Cut several strips because I'm going to have quite a bit of um, barn covering here that I'm going to want to do. And I can do that. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and cut a few more strips as quickly as I can here. Okay, And I'm going to do this just like I cut onions when I'm making a casserole. I'm going to stack up my strips, not too many because your scissors need to be able to get through them. Cut several strips, get them all stacked evenly, and uh, get them at one end or the other, get them organized. Uh, when you're going to cut celery on the cutting board, you can stack them side by side or all bundled and then make one cut. And so I'm going to be cutting squares about like that. Can you see about the size of squares that I'm going to cut? And if I can cut several at a time, I'm going to save myself a lot of time. Keep the ends even and cut some squares. Because you're going to need a lot of these to cover your barns. And uh, so you might want to do that ahead of time. And don't worry if you've got some that are shaped uh, not perfect squares here. You'll notice that one's a little bit um, off. It's got a diagonal corner. You may want to have one that has a diagonal uh, when you're getting ready to lay it in here against that angle. You see that? It may fit in there. So I've got some, uh, I'll go ahead and finish cutting these fellows really quickly. And that way I've got some uh, reds to work with here. Tell you one tool I forgot to list in the tools that you need that you're definitely going to be glad you had is a rag, a damp rag. And um, in my case, I have um, some rags that I've used for a very long time. They are terry cloth rags, and I've used them for watercolor. So they're stained, but this particular one's clean, but it's stained. I went to the sink and I dampened it. It's not dripping wet, but it's wet enough that if I've got glue on my fingers, I can rub my fingers on here and get the glue off. This is a godsend. You want to be sure that wherever you put it, you can reach it easily, but you don't want it touching your paper. If it's touching your paper, you're going to have paper that gets all rumply and ruined. So keep it away from your paper, but have it close at hand to wipe your fingers because gluing in this particular project is going to be sticky and messy and having a damp cloth close by is good. Do not worry about getting glue on your rag. Um, you could use a dishcloth or a washcloth, and both of them will, uh, with soap and water, will wash in the laundry and the glue will go away. Now I'm ready to begin uh, putting color down here, and so I think I will start with this large barn area here and uh, begin putting in my uh, pieces that I've cut of the uh, red orange. And I notice I got them mixed up here, got a little bit of my red red, so I'm going to use that red in my shadows and the black in my shadows. So I'm going to pull those colors down here close by and be ready to add my, uh, you know, notice I've got red orange and then red and then my black. And so I'm going to begin, and <clears throat> I've cut a whole pile of these, and I'm not going to try to uh, show you every single piece I put down, but hopefully you'll get the idea of how this is going to go. So I want some pieces separated out here, and, and when they're dry and, and you don't have a gluey fingertip, uh, to pick up a piece you can slide it to the edge of the table, you can dampen your finger with the tip of your tongue and touch it, and your pick finger can pick up uh, a piece. Open your glue stick, put a little glue on your first piece, and let's get started. I'm going to start down here in the lower corner, and I want my piece, uh, you've got enough glue on it, it'll scooch around a bit, but you don't have a long time. It tends to grab pretty quickly. I'm going to start there in the corner. I'm going to do another one beside it, 
and I'm going to do little rows. I want to leave a little tiny uh, color, uh, a crack of white in between. And uh, so these squares are not exactly um, the same size, but they're close. If we were uh, making a mosaic with tile or stone, the stones would be similar size, but not absolutely identical, and so that's what's our issue. Now, as I get close to this door, I wanted to leave that dark line, but you see that square is too close, too big, so I'm going to trim it down. This is where having your scissors at hand is going to help. I'm going to trim it down and see. It really is significantly. It needs to be smaller. Yep, there we go. So I'm going to put a tiny, I'm going to use the edge of my glue and put a small amount in there, and then I can slide this little fellow right in there beside it. And I want to get it down to the, get him square. And I'm going to do another row and continue across. Once again, I have a little triangular shape that I need to cut here. So I'm going to take one of my squares and uh, kind of cut it diagonally. And this time I am going to test before I stick it in there to see that it's the right shape and size. And I'm thinking that it's probably just about perfect. That was a good choice. I'm going to I want you to notice that I have not um, made absolutely every uh, space in between perfect. My lines are moving a little bit. Give yourself a little room to have some artistic license. So here we want to have uh, light and dark to help us define um, our silo. As you recall, we made curved lines as we got farther and farther away. As the cylinder goes up and away from our uh, straight on view, the lines tend to curve that give us the sense that this is a curved object. And as we're looking straight on to the cube, the lines are straighter. And so one of the other things that we want to do visually to make this uh, silo look round is to add a highlight along the center front there. So I'm going to take my um, colors that are my grays that I want to use here and I have already cut from my grays some strips uh, of the deeper gray and the lighter gray and then I'm going to use the back side, pardon me, the back side of some of these grays. And so I'm going to push my reds away for right now. I'll complete that later. But to give you an idea of um, how to put up a, a highlight. We'll start with the highlight and we're going to use the lighter of the grays. And I'm going to start in the center. I'm not going to make a full just straight up of their line, but I'm going to start here and put um, a square of the lighter gray right in there. And I'm going to go up, up two or three of these medium light grays. And, uh, Oops, it's just a little big. I'm going to trim it down just a hair. And he's a little long. So if you kind of, when we were cutting our squares in the interest of speed, sometimes you're going to have to do some trimming to get your, um, do one more thing to trim before you put it on there. <clears throat> one last, this color. I'm stacking them up in lines. I want to get some rows going here. This is kind of architectural, so keeping nice straight rows is going to be helpful. Now I've got the, I want to do um, a shape up there that's going to um, be the highlight across the top. And so I'm going to cut one of my larger pieces that I've got here. Let's see, that'll probably find one of my big ones. There's a nice big one right there. And I'm going to cut a curvy top to that. And look at that and see. Oh, it's 
yeah, I think that'll work. It's going to give the sense of having a, a curved, round top. So there's my highlight all the way. Now I'm going to use my darker colors and fill in with them on each side so I'll have the sense of roundness. So let's just try that right now. I'm going to try one of my uh, squares here on the side of that. I'm going to carve off the top edge and finish work from the top down. I'll show you something about coming to an angle or a change of shape. I've come here and you can see that this square here is not going to be a full square. It's going to bump into that. So I took a square of color and I took my scissors and I held it here and figured out what angle I wanted to cut. And so now I'm ready. I cut off part of that corner to fit this in there. And now it fits along that roof line. It's I've worked a little longer on this particular um, mosaic piece that's done with all the same shape pieces. And I've got several things I'd like to talk with you about. You notice I have a group of pieces of several different colors that I'm working on in the grass here. And let me tell you why. When I look at this picture, you'll see that in the photograph, the grass that's farther away from us in the distance is much lighter than what is in the foreground. As we get closer, there's a, a more definition and more color emerges as it gets closer to us as the viewer. And so I created across the back of my picture here using my ivory color um, paper, a couple of rows and much more uh, light and no browns way back there. I'm going to work forward giving a sense of um, more and more definition. As I continue to move forward I'm going to try to create some patches of brown that will be more and more uh, like they're in groups of uh, the grass pieces. As you can see, there's uh, areas of brown, so there will be more brown and more definition as I get closer. That will give us this sense of distance. Another tool that I have used to um, create in this picture is to mix several colors of green. You'll notice here in the bushes that I've used several different colors. There's a yellow green, a light green, and two two different medium greens. And I put them at random in this bush. And my plan was to let um, my eye do the mixing. And it works really well. You remember that we chose a, a red-orange that's closer to the color in our picture for the main part of our barn. We also uh, chose red to use as our shadow up underneath here. And I want you to see how convincing that actually becomes. It's rather surprising. The dark green here and the medium and lighter green at the upper edge where the sun is coming down and coloring is part of what we're doing to accomplish a sense of reality, even though it's not a, a perfect um, picture. You'll notice I made some mistakes. My little square right there, you notice it's a little bit off. Here I didn't cut my square quite large, I'm sorry, a little bit bigger. Here's another place that it's not perfectly square. But I like the charm of that. I think that it really gives this picture a little touch of the artist actually made this. It isn't a photograph. I've enjoyed it immensely. Well, I'm <clears throat> working on, I'll finish up the grass and then I'm planning to work in the sky. And I realized that the picture that I was looking at is really very, very plain blue sky. There's little or no definition. And so what I want to do is add some clouds. So I've drawn in some, penciled in some cloud shapes here. You can see there's a cloud shape and another cloud shape. Let me darken them so you can see where I'll put them. I'm going to give them a, a line. And then when I begin to put my pieces into the sky, I'm going to, um, and these a little bit on the edge of cartoony, but I still like the idea of having a few clouds in my sky here. And I'm going to let one come in from the outside edge to help engage my viewer to the edge. 
Maybe one over here too. How's that? So there we are. On a sunny day in farm country, often there will be clouds that seem to like they're sitting on a glass plate and you can look under. So to create those clouds, I'm going to be using white paper. I will actually add white on top of the white that I have here, but I will um, use a light, very, very light gray in a band underneath. Um, I don't know if you've ever observed clouds, but when the sun is coming down, the tops will be lit and bright white, but there'll often be a shadow underneath that gives us the shape and the definition. So I'll do that to create my cloud shapes. And then, um, in fact, let me show you. I think that what I'll do is create shadows that go like that, maybe to help emphasize the shapes of the big puffiness of them. So I could indicate that with a maybe a pencil line that I'm going to put the, that gray in that shape underneath there to give those clouds a puffy shape. I might even add little uh, triangle areas of uh, gray in there so that they look like they're rounded. So the rest of the sky, I believe, I'll use two or three, maybe even as many as four different shades of blue. You'll want uh, what's farthest away from you to be the lightest, and as it gets higher in the sky, it gets a deeper and stronger blue. Think in terms of looking up into the sky and seeing how far away the vast heavens are, and we have an incredible uh, depth of blue at the top, and so as it gets closer to the ground and farther away from us as the viewer, it will get lighter and lighter. So I will use a progression of blues from dark to light to give this full sense of depth in my picture. We've finished up the first style of mosaic work where we used almost exactly the same size shape uh, pieces to create the entire picture. So now I'd like to show you another method that is a little more um, energetic, it's a little more complicated. I really liked working on this particular one and so I want to show you how to go about this. Our goal here in this particular piece is to get not only um, eye blending of color by setting different colors side by side like we did in the other picture, but also we need to um, create some motion and energy and rhythm in this. And so each of these strands of grass, each of these petals, the uh, roundness and curv curvy parts of this butterfly, the angular flat panels of the leaves, we want to cut pieces of paper that are going to um, go in uh, directions that um, help emphasize the shapes and the um, action that's happening in those. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to start with my leaves and once again we want to think about where is the light coming from. Uh, remember we talked about the silo and the, the, um, the light part where the light is hitting that silo to develop a sense of depth and reality. We want to think in terms of where is the lightest the light coming from the sunshine is coming down and in this case we're going to have imagine that the sun is coming down on this image and so the outside edges of these leaves these top tip parts of the leaves and the outer edges of our petals uh, of our flower we're going to want to have lighter where the sun is making the color much lighter um, and underneath where things are shadowed underneath the, the uh, petals at the bottom underneath this butterfly and, tucked under there, those leaves will want to have darker. So let's begin, and I'm going to use the lightest light and start at the tips and work down on this. Um, I have um, light green. You notice I've chosen three greens here, medium, light, medium, and dark. I have done kind of the same thing with my blues. I've done, I've chosen a couple of blues for my flowers, and I have chosen brown and yellow for the centers. Now, the brown and the yellow in the centers of these two flowers, this little spot here and these, I'm going to go back to a fairly even size piece to put in there so that I get a, 
a texture, kind of like you know how a sunflower center has a texture to it when you look at visually, there's a texture. So in those, I'm going to use fairly even little round pebbly shape pieces. But in these leaves and in the petals, I'm going to cut pieces that are quite different than the little even roundish shapes that we had before. So let me begin with the green. And I'm going to begin with this uh, place right here along the edges of these leaves. And I'm going to cut uh, pieces that are, uh, let me see if I can show you what I'm talking about. I want to put a piece here that cover. oh that one points too much. Let me see, maybe I can, well I want to, it's going up and it's not going to fit. So I'm going to cut a, a curve on that. There we go. Too much. Okay, this is going to fit into that tip right there. Can you see? But it's still a little wide, so I'm going to take it back. And this is going to take a little bit of trimming and uh, thinking through. So I'm going to trim out a little bit. Using my smaller scissors will make it easier. Anyway, so I'm going to trim away. You can see I took away a sliver of the green. And I'm going to lay this in here and imagine. Now, I want you to see that it is following the shape of the leaf. I'm deliberately cutting pieces that are going to do that. I've also, instead of cutting it straight across, I've given it kind of an angle. And the next piece that I cut there, I am going to try cutting that um, with... I'm going to cut a sliver here and see if I can show you what I'm talking about. As I put this piece on here, you'll notice that I've got a white space that leaves kind of a, a wedge of white in there. So I want to take this next piece that's long and trim, and I want to cut an angle that matches that angle so that I help emphasize, even using my little white spaces, I want to emphasize the action and the direction of this particular leaf. Now I've tapered that down because I think I'm done with that highlight there. I think I'll go ahead and cut a couple of highlights for this leaf here. And um, and then I'm going to want to cut the other end as well and probably the same direction. Now I can lay it in there and you can see that I have, let me use my pencil eraser to move this around so you can see better. I'm laying it there uh, where I've got a gap and I'm following the curve of this particular um, thing. So when I get ready to glue those down, I have this sensation of um, action and movement with, that follows the leaf. So I'll do a little bit of that and let you watch how that will proceed. begin kind of my middle value color. And I realize that these highlights are fairly thin. I don't need to keep everything quite exactly that thin. So I'm going to go ahead and cut a little bit thicker place on these ones here. And you can see I can kind of eyeball how big I want. So I'm going to cut a chunk like this and see if I can get... I'm probably going to need to round that corner a little like that to fit in there. Can you see that? And as I'm getting this, I'm realizing that part of what's happening here is this motion by the pieces that I've cut and the angles. When I come to the blue and I'm ready to work there, let me show you what I would do with the blue. I would like to begin from the center and work out to create um, the sense of um, motion and angle from the middle um, where these things are coming out from the middle and the darkness underneath here. And so I'm going to uh, cut some triangles and it's probably going to be pretty easy here at first to get situated and create some, um, there's a long one, so I'm going to fit that in there, but you see that it 
doesn't have an end that follows the curve here, so I'm going to give it a little bit of a trim near the end. Uh, let's do a little bit of a curvy trim. And I think I would like that to be like right in there. From You can see that it fits up against that curve and it goes down and out in the direction that the petal grows. And I'll cut several more of these um, angles. Let's see. <clears throat> and uh, I think I'll oh, some of these nice long ones here. That's a little bit. Um, I'm going to cut a, a little bit off the other side so it's not quite so straight. And uh, maybe I'll cut a little dip into that one so it can go up underneath here. Can you see how it kind of goes around that little bulge in the center there? And uh, it comes out at an angle that follows the pattern of the um, part of the uh, picture that I want. Then I'll come back and put in uh, my pieces of, um, I'm going to cut a scrap off here so I don't have to work with that great big piece. I'm going to cut some wedges that fit in in between there. And they are not necessarily going to be such perfect wedges wedge-shaped pieces. Maybe they will be, um, let's do that. That's awfully long. I'm going to cut a couple of these this way and uh, see if that works. You. This is an experiment and every part of it is part of your artistic response to this. I'm going to tuck that in there near there and maybe, let's see, that looks like it needs to be quite a bit thinner. Um, oops. Here I am using these great big scissors, and that makes them awkward. Now notice that these are not all perfectly the same shape, but they're going to work together to fill in the empty places and still begin creating that uh, movement and action that's there. If I were to uh, make the center like, like the uh, pebbly texture, just like we did before um, when we were cutting them, fairly small pieces. This time, instead of cutting actual squares, I'm just going to cut little circles. Uh, I keep picking up these giant scissors. Um, I'm going to cut some fairly small pieces of brown and uh, yellow because I want my center to look brown, but I don't want it to be a flat and dead brown. And so I'll just do a few here to show you what I'm talking about. And uh, when you're cutting a circle, if you put your scissor there and turn the paper. Keep the blade stiff. Notice I didn't move the scissor, I moved the paper. And I can cut a circle by moving the paper uh, around. You see that? And there I am, I've got some circles cut. And uh, there we go. So that's one of your hints about uh, creating circles. Cut another chunk off here. I'm not going to need a lot of this color. It's amazing how little paper it actually takes to do the mosaic. Same thing, I'm going to do circles to get some yellow circles. And I'll do three or four of them here for you so you can see what it will look like to have some pebbly texture centers. And uh, oh, come on, there we go. You have to readjust now and then. Okay. Um, take my fingertip and these will be able to be much more random. And uh, actually, you could make the circles bigger or smaller. Uh, I like kind of this middle little one, so it'll have a real pebbly look. Oh, come on, let go. Um, and the fact that they don't have to be perfect is really great because then you don't feel nearly as stressed about things not looking perfect. Anyway, you get the idea here that my centers now can be, and I'll tuck these fairly close and at random, and I'll get that textured center. When we come to the butterfly, we'll basically do the same thing. I will be cutting uh, circles of my different purples, and I'm planning to use some yellow uh, to pop it out. And I will cut small black pieces, 
that fit in the shape for my um, butterfly's body. And in my leaves, I'm going to cut fairly wide wedges to fit in, and I'm going to start with darkest green and work between these in wedges um, so that by the tips we have a light green and underneath where these are being hidden. Now, the, this uh, part of the um, flower petals here behind the butterfly and this lower edge here are quite dark, so I'm going to use quite a bit of the darker blue underneath here in addition to the dark highlights that come out. I'm also going to use a few little nips of, of dark blue on the outer edges to um, give them some depth as if there were folds in the edges of the soft petal and catching the light and keeping uh, shadows and that sort of thing. Behind here is another place there's quite a bit of shadow, so this back portion here is going to be quite a bit darker. The same will be true in this portion of the petal that's underneath here. I will be putting quite a bit of dark blue under there and a lot more light in here. I'll continue working and in my leaves as I'm continuing this uh, lengthy thing to follow the, the, the direction of the leaves, as I get down here I'm going to use stronger uh, darks and my pieces will widen slightly just as the, the stem of the or the blade of grass gets wider. My pieces can just gradually get wider. So I have a sense of motion and a sense of what's actually going on in the world. And it's all uh, been stylized, and yet it is still has a sense of reality. So that is what's going to happen. So I'll go ahead and continue working on this and show you a finished product. I've finished the flowers. And before I go on to uh, putting in the leaves and the butterfly, I'd like you to notice one of the most important things that I'd like you to learn in this particular lesson. The pieces I've cut are not little stone-shaped pieces like you might find in a floor mosaic in uh, Roman times, but they are deliberately chosen and placed so that they give a sense of action and shape. Um, you'll notice that the centers of the two flowers that we have here are kind of pebbly in texture because of the shapes of pieces that I cut. These ones have a, a definite sense of direction and rhythm. You'll notice these uh, repeated lines that go the same direction, the, the open spaces between the uh, places of paper. That creates a rhythm and a sense of motion. I'm sure that you've seen flowers that have kind of ridges that run the length of their petals. Well, that's the effect I was going for. And you'll notice in the grasses we've got the same upward motion uh, that follows that. Instead of making little blocks and squares that fill things in, I've chosen to cut longer, more narrow pieces that follow the direction that the grass would grow. And so I get a more, and you see it here as I'm beginning to send some green up this particular piece. So that's what's in process here. I'm going to continue working and we'll see what happens uh, when I get uh, to the point of putting in the background. Now, I am planning to do a background, and I think that my background is going to be a fairly uh, even texture. I don't know. I want to wait and see. So I'm not going to start with the background. I'm going to work on the things that are inside of my um, picture first before I begin the negative space. You can see that I've finished putting on the um, pieces of grass, the light and darks, um, the leaves, and the petals of my flower, and even the centers. I cut larger pieces uh, when I was ready to do that. I, I think I wanted a little bit more vivid texture in the center. But I want you to notice that my pieces got wider and bigger here, and they're fairly small up above. My wedges here in the leaves, um, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to tip it up a little better you can see that the wedges in the leaves um, are follow the lines that I had drawn and so it was helping to emphasize the action and shape of the leaf and you'll notice that under here, we, as I said earlier, we wanted this portion underneath to be fairly dark and uh, as if it were shadowed and you notice that the lighter blue is out here where the light would come. I've used some 
of these little um, wedges at the outer edges as if the petal is wrinkled and catching uh, a shadow. Now I'm ready to consider my butterfly and my thought is is that I'd like to put some spots of yellow in the tips of these designs here on its wings. I think I'll use dark purple to outline uh, this, this main body portion and then do the yellow pieces and then use uh, two maybe two or three shades of purple to uh, go in these other spots. So I've got a purple and yellow and black, well not black butterfly, but a purple and yellow butterfly. And my um, body, I'm going to cut pieces of black and I'll just cut the shape of these um, feelers out of black and just do them completely whole. I'm not going to try to put tiny, tiny pieces on them. Since I've used fairly large pieces here, I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then I'll come back and try to make a decision about the background. Um, I'm thinking that I'm going to want a fairly neutral, maybe kind of a gray background, possibly a light blue. I'm not really sure. So I'll wait and see until I've got my butterfly in what I want to do in the background. I'm fairly certain that my background is going to be much more uniform shaped pieces, a little like the other project that we did, so that it will have kind of just an even texture. I may use two or three colors to give it a little bit of variety, but like I said, we'll wait and see. So I'll start working on the butterfly and make some decisions about how I'm going to uh, put color down there. for my highlight pops of color here and so I will glue them down and then I'll begin working around them and I'll use um, <clears throat> the shapes of where they're at uh, and how they look that one get that over here I want to um, I will need to work around them so I'm probably going to be cutting some um, curved purple pieces lighter purple pieces that will come very much like we made these fit together, uh, cut them with angles that will go around and fit. They'll be small, fairly small curved pieces. And then I think in here I'll do more uh, pieces similar to this that will come out to meet what goes around uh, the tips. So I'll do that and we'll come back and see what it actually looks like. <music> see I finished putting uh, paper or pieces in here around half of the wing and the body and I left it undone so that you could see that I've used these shapes where I initially put in the yellow the pop of yellow and then I worked around them so each of these shapes is a little bit different and you'll notice that my butterfly uh, the shapes in and around these are different than the uh, pieces that I've chosen in my flowers and in the centers and in my leaves and grass. Each particular place in my mosaic, in this particular kind of work, I'm making the pieces suit the image that I'm trying to make. So you can see in the body of this particular um, one here, the body of the uh, butterfly, I've used kind of segmented pieces, a little bit bigger and clunkier than what I've used in these little fine, delicate pieces that fit around the edges. I hope you also notice that I used two really subtly different colors here. This chunk right in through here is just a smidge darker than the light purple that goes around here. And of course, then this dark outline blue. So I'm trying to make some subtle color shifts from this dark to the light from the dark edge that's in the shadow to the light, to even the lightest places where the sun is hitting. My goal is to create a 
somewhat realistic picture, but also to use um, my artistic liberty to create a sense of motion and, and um, interest and also to be kind of true to the image I'm trying. My thought about the background, which I'm not going to spend time doing and showing you on, on the video, but rather let you work that out yourself, I think that my background will be much more like the other version that we did that had uh, squares and bits that were fairly regular shape just to um, keep it um, simple. On the other hand, maybe I will do a little bit more uh, freeform shapes. I'm not sure. I'll experiment with it, uh, laying down a few pieces and seeing what I think. So I hope that when you choose to do a project that you will enjoy making a piece that has a lot of energy and rhythm. Use the color things that you've learned about creating a color scheme. Like in mine, I've chosen to do an analogous color scheme with a little pop of color. Um, that's the artistic license that you have. I hope that you enjoy working on your uh, mosaic piece, whether you choose to do the one with squares uh, and the same shape pieces, or whether you decide to use um, pieces that follow the shapes and forms, like the other um, mosaic piece that is in this video. Whichever it is, I hope you really enjoy uh, making this. Sit back and take your time and um, listen to some good music or a story on tape and uh, have a good experience of uh, working on an art project. So there you have a mosaic. Well, there you have it. We've made a mosaic together. I've enjoyed the process immensely. I hope you've learned about color harmony, about patterns and rhythms in your uh, compositions. There's so much that can be learned with a simple project like this. Mosaics are fun. It's been a great time. I hope you'll come back another time for another art tutorial with The Designing Woman. Goodbye.